Today's video is sponsored by Incogni, of whom more in a bit. In the Science Museum in London, and the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh, you can see a pair of very similar but very unusual machines. A pair of steam locomotives known as Puffing Billy and Wylam Dilly. These are, respectively, the oldest and second oldest steam locomotives in the world. Now, I should emphasise, they aren't the first railway locomotives ever built. The first engine ever built, or at least the first one that worked, was Richard Trevithick's Penny Darren locomotive of 1804, but it didn't survive. Puffing Billy dates from about a decade later, having been built between 1813 and 1814. Wylam Dilly followed in, we think, 1815. Records for that era tend to be patchy and a lot of information has had to be reconstructed by archaeologists and historians after the fact. Actually, there has been some dispute over which engine came first and indeed which one was Puffing Billy and which one was Wylam Dilly, but I'll get onto that later. So now we've settled which one was which, let's look into how and why they were built. They were the work of William Headley. Now, Headley is quite an interesting figure. Engineers like Timothy Hackworth and George Stevenson, who both have their own associations with these engines, were dedicated to the advancement of the technology. Headley seems to have just been interested in saving money. He was born in 1779 in Newburn, a village on the Tyne to the west of Newcastle. Like many lads in the northeast of England, he went into the coal mines. Being a smart lad, he trained as a colliery viewer, or manager as we would say now. He proved very talented, bringing innovations to his mines that made them highly profitable. In 1805, he was headhunted by Christopher Blackett, the owner of Wylam Colliery. At Wylam, they had a problem. The coal had to get from the colliery to the barges on the river by means of a wagonway, or primitive railway. This was achieved using horses, which could haul one or, at most, two wagons at a time, and needed a man to lead them. At this time, the Napoleonic Wars were in full swing. Fodder for horses was expensive, and labour was hard to come by. Blackett had heard of Richard Trevithick's new invention, and commissioned a locomotive to the same design, which was completed in 1805 and built by Thomas Waters. It never made it to Wylam. Why is unclear, but it seems likely that the engine would have been too heavy for the wooden rails of the wagonway. The same problem would scupper Trevithick's original engine. Blackett had the wagonway relayed with iron rails and approached Trevithick again. But by this time, Trevithick had become bored with steam locomotives and moved on to other projects. Meanwhile, elsewhere in Britain, other inventors had also seen the potential of the locomotive and a strange belief had arisen, namely that a steam locomotive that operated with smooth wheels on smooth rails could not haul anything more than its own weight. Even though Trevithick had repeatedly demonstrated that it was perfectly possible for such an engine to haul a load. A number of solutions were suggested to this non-existent problem. William Chapman came up with a locomotive fitted with a winding drum that could haul itself along a chain fitted in the middle of the track. John Blenkinsop invented the rack locomotive, which was equipped with a cogwheel that would engage with a rack rail alongside the track. This would later find success on railways that climbed mountains. And then there's my personal favourite, William Brunton's mechanical traveller, or steam horse, which was fitted with legs to push the engine along. Blenkinsop and locomotive designer Matthew Murray's system was the most successful, but it was expensive. And remember, Headley was all about the money. He, unlike Chapman, Brunton, Blenkinsop and Murray, didn't see anything wrong with Trevithick's way of doing things. When Blackett again got a bee in his bonnet about locomotives, Headley decided to experiment. If you want a smooth experience online, you do well to check out this video's sponsor, Incogni. If you're online without proper protection, your data can easily get derailed. Case in point, I used to get so much spam email. Like, I had more spam than Monty Python. And the reason for that is that the websites you visit harvest your data, everything from your browsing habits to your name and address. 
They sell it on to data brokers who sell it on to, well, anyone who pays. Insurance companies, governments, even criminals. That leaves you open to targeted advertising, spam and, worst of all, identity theft. Which in turn can make you a victim of fraudsters with the associated risks of ruined credit and criminal investigation. It's pretty grim is what I'm saying. Now, you can demand that the brokers delete your data, and they have to do so by law. But there's a lot of them, and they don't make it easy. That's where Incogni comes in. Just create an account, authorise them to work on your behalf, and let them hold the broker's feet to the fire. What's more, there's an exclusive offer for viewers of this channel. The first 100 people to click the link in the description below and sign up using the code HAZARD get a remarkable 60% off. And you can stay on track with a safer, more secure browsing experience. Speaking of staying on track, I wonder what Headley is up to. In order to test his hypothesis, Headley came up with a sort of human-powered locomotive. A trolley that could be cranked along the rails by four men. This demonstrated that yes, smooth wheels on smooth rails could absolutely be used to haul heavy loads. Emboldened by this, Headley brought Thomas Waters in to fit his trolley with a boiler and gears and convert it into a locomotive. The resulting machine was a very poor steamer and only made it through its test steaming after Waters deliberately shut the safety valve. But it proved able to haul up to five wagons on subsequent tests. It was good enough for Blackett to authorise Headley to go back to the drawing board. So Headley patented his own locomotive design in 1813. Oddly enough, his original design included spikes on the inside of the wheels that could stick into the ground between the rails to give the engine more grip, which raises questions about Headley's faith in his own data. Anyway, the finished engine didn't include this feature. Now the question arises of who was actually responsible for what on the locomotive. Headley did not build the locomotive alone, the engine right at the mine was Jonathan Forster. The head blacksmith was Timothy Hackworth. All three are known to have been involved in the construction of the locomotive, though to what extent is unknown. Headley and his sons pushed the idea that it was basically all Headley's work, and we'll get onto their reasons for that later. But Headley didn't make substantial developments beyond his initial designs, and Hackworth would go on to be viewed as the greatest locomotive engineer of his day, with several innovations to his name. And as to what part Forster played, or whether Waters was involved, we just don't know. Regardless of who did what, the locomotive was undoubtedly top of the line for the day. It was powered by two cylinders with valve gear mounted above the boiler, an idea borrowed from Blenkinsop and Murray. The boiler itself was of wrought iron. Boilers in those days could be rather wasteful things. Heat was provided by a single tube passing from the firebox to the chimney, so only a fraction of the energy generated actually went towards heating the water. This boiler had a return flue, i.e. the tube doubled back on itself to provide twice the heating area meaning that the firebox and the chimney were both at the same end, and raising the question as to which end of the engine is the front and which is the back. It had four wheels, at least at first, and these were coupled together to improve traction. The engine, which would become known as Puffing Billy, was probably completed early in 1814, but again, we don't know for sure. It proved a success. Headley stated that it could regularly haul eight coal wagons. Other observers, such as Matthew Nicholson, who worked on the wagon way, reckoned it was even better. He claimed it could do the work of ten horses, which puts its load between ten and twenty wagons. You might say that it went like Billy-o. Or not. You see, it has been claimed that Puffing Billy was the origin of the phrase to go like Billy-o. I don't think this is true. For one thing, while the engine was strong, it certainly wasn't fast. It moved at about four to five miles per hour with a load. For another thing, I doubt that anyone outside of Wylam Colliery and the early locomotive engineering scene would have been aware of it. And for a third, it doesn't appear to have been known as Puffing Billy until much later. According to Robert Young's admittedly somewhat dated book, Hackworth and the Locomotive, the engine was nicknamed the Grasshopper or the Dilly. So, I think it's very unlikely that the term comes from Headley's engine, fun though the theory is. 
Sorry, I feel like every time I talk about the origin of a word or phrase, I just ruin everyone's fun. Regardless of whether it went like Bilio or not, the engine was successful enough for a second engine to be built soon afterwards. This engine would become known as Wylam Dilly, although again it's not clear when or how official this name was. It also seems that all of the locomotives used at Wylam Colliery were nicknamed Wylam Dillies, so I don't know what was special about this one. Nevertheless, it did incorporate improvements on the original design. Other engines would follow. The success of the engines drew attention from other engineers. Indeed, John Forster brought a friend of his from Killingworth Colliery to see the engines at work. That friend was George Stevenson, and his observations would come to influence his first engine that would be constructed later in 1814. Although the engines were stronger than a horse, they weighed 8.3 tonnes and were therefore far heavier. Blackett wasn't at all happy at the prospect of having to relay his track again, and so Headley rebuilt Billy and Dilly to run on eight wheels to better distribute the weight. This happened sometime between 1815 and 1817. In 1822, Wylam Dilly found an unusual second purpose. That year, there was a strike by the Keelmen on the River Tyne. Keels was the name given to the coal barges that travelled between the quays and the ships, and they formed a vital link in the coal supply chain. Headley's solution to the strike was to take the dilly off its wheels, stick it in a keel, and convert it into a tugboat. Following this adventure, it returned to the rails. In 1827, Headley, by now a wealthy businessman, left Wylam Colliery. While he would work with locomotives again, his primary interest remained in the ownership and management of coal mines. Two years later, though, an event took place that would have a dramatic effect on Headley's reputation. A railway was being built between Liverpool and Manchester, unlike anything built before. The first intercity railway. The directors of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway held a competition at the village of Rainhill to find a locomotive worthy of their new line. One of the competitors was Timothy Hackworth with his engine Saint Pere. Hackworth had left Wylam Colliery in 1815 because, as a strict Methodist, he refused to work Sundays. Saint Pere was the runner up. The indisputable winner was a locomotive called Rocket, built by none other than George Stevenson with his son Robert. Rocket was an incredibly advanced machine compared to the lumbering, puffing Billy and Wylam Dilly, and would form the basis of every subsequent steam locomotive. An unfortunate byproduct of this was that George Stevenson would come to be known as the father of the locomotive and would be identified as such by one Dr. Dionysus Lardner in a lecture in 1836. Naturally, Headley was not going to take this lying down and wrote an open letter to Dr. Lardner that was carried in every newspaper in Newcastle for three weeks. In this, he set his own role in the development of the locomotive out, and though he did give credit to Trevithick, he makes it clear that he believed himself to be a better candidate for the title of father of the locomotive. It seems that this did not have the desired effect, as would become clear a couple of decades later. In 1837, Headley would pass his mining interests on to his sons and go into retirement. He would pass away on the 9th of January 1843. In 1857, Dr. Samuel Smiles published a biography of Stevenson. This was as much an aspirational textbook as a historical account, and it restated the claim that Stevenson was the father of the locomotive. Headley's eldest son, Oswald, rushed to his father's defence with a book called Who Invented the Locomotive Engine? That was published in 1858. Even so, the question of how much of an innovator Headley actually was has been much disputed over the two centuries since Puffing Billy first took to the rails. But what of the engines themselves? Well, in 1830, the wagonway was relayed with stronger cast-iron rails, and the remaining engines, of which there were probably three, were re-rebuilt back to their four-wheeled form. They continued plodding along for three more decades. By the 1860s, the rail network of Britain was pretty well established, and so it became cheaper and easier to transport coal from Wylam Colliery to Newcastle via the Northeastern Railway. In 1862, Wylam Colliery had two locomotives on a wagonway that was little used. Captain Blackett, son of the original, realised the importance of Puffing Billy and loaned it to the Patent Museum, later the Science Museum. 
it would be sold for £200 two years later. That left Wylam Dilly, which had little enough work to do. The mine, meanwhile, was having troubles of its own. It was in financial trouble, largely due to a major flood, and in 1868 it closed down. The equipment was put up for auction in 1869, and Headley's sons bought Wylam Dilly for preservation. In stark contrast to Puffing Billy, Wylam Dilly was sold for £16.10, shillings, or basically scrap value. Curiously, the sale listing described the engine as Puffing Billy. While most people saw little value in this almost hilariously outdated locomotive, the Headleys had it restored and placed on display, and in 1882 it was presented to the Royal Scottish Museum in Edinburgh. As you might imagine, based on the various twists and turns of the story of these two engines, there was some confusion about them. Headley didn't identify his locomotives by name, and they carry no numbers. Given that both were known at one point or another as Puffing Billy, and both were known as A. Wylam Dilly, it's no surprise that there was some dispute over which engine was the older. An archaeological survey in 2008 settled the matter once and for all. Puffing Billy was the older engine, and Wylam Dilly would have to settle for being the second oldest. Which is still pretty good. The engines are remarkable survivors of the pioneering age of railways, but it took quite a while for them to be recognised as such. The development of locomotives was a slow evolution over three decades, from the primitive Penny Darren locomotive to the then-advanced rocket. Puffing Billy and Wylam Dilly are a vital link in the line of descent. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please do leave a like and consider subscribing for more. I would like to thank my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon and here on YouTube for your support. You are the mechanical linkage to my four wheels. Thanks also to Incogni for sponsoring this video. Click on the link in the description below to take advantage of their offer. And I'll see you all again very soon. Cheerio.